Hello and welcome to the 133rd episode of From Alpha to Omega. Today is Thursday the 24th of September 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We are joined by Anne McShane, a human rights lawyer based in Ireland who recently completed her PhD on the role of the Zhenotyel, the section of the Russian Communist Party devoted to women's affairs in the 1920s in Soviet Central Asia. We talk about why major figures like Alexandra Kollontai and Inessa Armand didn't consider themselves feminists, and what this implies for our emancipationary politics. This week I had the new patrons A. Adebayo, Alan Gibson and Alan Spinato to thank. If you like the sound of two extra Patreon-only episodes and two live streams every month and marketing it up on the Emancipation Network Discord server, why not become a patron? It's all the rage, apparently. Anyways, to the interview. So, Anne, you just recently finished, uh, just last year, a PhD on... uh, Well, you tell us what it was on. What was the title? Okay, so the title of my PhD was Bringing Emancipation to the Women of the East. So it is about the Women's Department of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union and their work among women in Central Asia in the 1920s. Basically, their intervention into that society in order to assist women in gaining liberation from the oppression that they lived under. So this was the, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, is this the Zenotel, or how do you so, say yeah. it? Gen, Genotel, it's a, so it's an abbreviated form, Gen, Genshina is woman, Otel is department, so the Genotel was the women's department of the uh, Central Committee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, so yeah. How important was this Zenotel then to the Central Committee? So basically, it was something that was foisted on them, really. It wasn't something that the Central Committee set on to create itself in 1917. So there was a history before the revolution of women within the communist movement, the RSDLP in Russia, fighting for women's rights to be recognised and to be made part of the programme and strategy for change. And after the revolution, there was a period of time, obviously we had the February revolution with the women and then coming out onto the streets. And then um, there was lots of movement, lots of women's organisations set up during 1917. And in uh, 1918, however, it became apparent that despite the fact that these laws had been brought into being, which gave women, you know, equality under all aspects of the law in the Soviet Union, uh, introduced divorce, like all of these progressive measures, that in reality, very little had changed for many women. And Alexandra Kollontine and Nessa Armand and Krupskaya, all these familiar names, along with lots of other women, came together and held, uh, organized a Congress in late 1918 and from that congress came bodies which were then the following year in august september 1919 made into the genot gel so i suppose they had started the initiative themselves they had set up these commissions they basically gone well we're not going to wait any longer we're going to start to do this ourselves and they had some support from some people within the Communist Party, but the Genot Gel was, I think, a concession to something that was already that already existed. And perhaps you'd say there's been different analysis of it, but perhaps a concession and an attempt to control a movement among women for, for change, to make sure that it didn't become something which threatens the party itself, I would say, quite honestly, yeah. When you say threaten the party, threaten it how? Well, I would say because threaten, because make women more, like women making more demands for change from the party. So like 
women had supported the Bolsheviks. Many women had supported the Bolsheviks in 1917, and they had, but they had lost support in 1918. And I think that have, women haven't got involved in the Soviets. They wanted them, you know, they wanted to continue having support from them. I would say an autonomous women's movement or a semi-autonomous women's movement could have been a pressure that they didn't want to contend with, particularly in relation to issues to do with the civil war, support for the civil war, and issues to do with, you know, in the workplace as well. So women making demands for rights in the workplace, childcare facilities. In any event, I would say that they saw the potential for a mass movement here and they wanted to bring it under some kind of control. But I mean, there's no doubt also that Lenin supported one of the few leaders of the of the Communist Party who supported the women's movement. He certainly did support it. But I think if you read what he said in an interview with Clara Zetkin a couple of years later, he believed that the working class women really needed to be organized to support the communist project. So there was a kind of degree of manipulation, I suppose I would say, in relation to the approach to the women's movement at the time. It seems like, uh, from what I read of your article, it seems like that the liberation of women was given a very secondary rank behind the importance of the civil war. And Colin Ty and these were arguing about how it could be it could be like a kind of a central like lever to their advantage in the civil war. Is that true? Yeah. So I think the issue for for Colin Ty and for Ines Armand and for other women who led that organization, the central issue was that you couldn't have socialism without the full involvement of women. You couldn't have it like the, that the idea that you would have first socialism, which was run by men, and then like further down the road, when it was able to afford to, I don't know, provide creches or bring women into the workforce, then it would do so. That, 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 that was a completely wrong approach that you needed an approach, basically, which challenged the whole manner in which people lived and involved women alongside men as equals alongside men in the struggle for socialism. And indeed, during the Civil War, the Genot Diel did go out to campaign to win women to the Bolshevik side, to the side of the Red Army, and organise all sorts of different projects around that. But I think that, that the idea really, unfortunately, was that the women's question was important, but that no real progress could be made on it until society, until socialism was more developed. It was something for further down the road. Yeah, so like those, that idea of like the releasing women from the from the long oppression that they've lived with, like that that came out of the work as well of Engels and and Babel. How, did you did you read all that stuff for your for your yeah. PhD? Yeah, yeah. How does it stack up now? This is like the origin of family, private property, and state. I haven't read it. Like, how does it stack up now with respect to like kind of modern anthropological work? Well, actually, like the modern anthropological work that's been done by the likes of Chris Nice and Camilla Power, that really, really connects very strongly with what Engels and Babel were arguing at the time and their kind of development of the ideas from Charles Morgan, the anthropologist who, who looked at, at primitive tribes and the existence of primitive communism. So the, like the idea that they argued, which I think has been proved by later research, is that early communist society was egalitarian, was communal, and, and, and women played a central role in that society. That therefore, when you're looking to change society in a communist manner, that you have to consider the question of women's role, the role of the family, and the full involvement of women as equals in society as a kind of a central aspect of that, of that program, if that makes sense. That if you don't do that, then you're basically really only involving one half of society and you're not challenging 
the nature of society itself in a real way because you're going well domestic labor child care blah 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 all these things they're women's role um you, you're, not, yeah. you're not thinking about it in, like in, in in the way you should which is that all of those aspects of our society should be socialized yeah you're you're relegating like uh, the revolution to the factory you know yeah. you're revolutionizing factory relations and and working relations but not social relations exactly yeah exactly you're not challenging our relations with each other exactly you're saying well it can be things can say as they are because why, why would you change them well for one for, for you know for lots of men obviously they they wouldn't want to change them because they they don't want disruption in their domestic lives they don't want women and this is what happened in the Soviet Union is that lots of party men didn't want women going out, getting involved in things and not being at home to look after the kids or cook the dinner. I mean, it's interesting, I'm just maybe going off the tangent here, but if you look at other struggles, say, for instance, in Britain during the miners' strike in 1984 and 1985, lots of women got involved in the miners, women against pit closures and the miners' support groups. and their activity uh, had huge repercussions for their own family lives, particularly afterwards, lots of divorces, because they didn't want to go back to how they'd been before. They didn't want to go back to listening to Coronation Street or watching Coronation Street or EastEnders. They'd become politicized individuals, you know? Not that there's anything wrong with soap operas, you know? But <laughs> like as, a, as an example, that like that's apparently, that was a quote in some, in some interview that one of them gave, but they had changed. They had profound implications for those women to get involved in politics. And they just didn't want to go back to how things were. They didn't want to go back to being, you know, domestic a servant, really, which is what their lives had been before that strike. Yeah, and some of the more striking images I have in my head for being a kid is of, like, those women committees. So do you want to tell us then about the actual, the kind of radical reforms of family life that the Soviets actually did push through early on in the after the revolution? Well, as I said before, there were major changes in the law. Illegitimacy was basically outlawed. So, you know, there wouldn't be any discrimination between somebody who was born of a legal marriage and somebody who was born outside of marriage. Marriage itself was made really more like secular. Um, divorce was free and w was introduced. There were lots of uh, laws that came in like that. Then in terms of the, the changes that came about, these a lot of these had to do with what the Jeanne Hotel did and took the lead in doing. I mean, bef and before them, before the Jeanne Hotel, there had been a group organized around a journal called Rabotnitsa, Woman Worker, which had been relaunched in early 1917. So what they did was they did things like they set up a public canteen so you know, men, women and children could go and eat in the public canteen as opposed to go home to the house for food. They set up collective laundry facilities. They set up educational hubs for women. You know, literacy, literacy centres were really important. The other thing that uh, Ines Armand was intrinsic in doing was setting up delegate meetings. And these delegate meetings were a form of organisation, particularly for women in factories. So basically, they came together, they elected delegates, and these delegates went on to work as uh, trainees in, say, a government department or in factory department or so something where they needed to learn a skill. And then after six months, they came back and another person went on and took their place. And the idea was that they would all learn to run things, I suppose. You know, it's like every every person learns to run society or learns to be part of it. So it wasn't it was meant to uh, mean that they wouldn't end up in the lowest levels of the workforce, but that they could become skilled and that then when they would come back into uh, when they'd finished their apprenticeship, that they could teach other women as well those skills as well as other people going forward to be trained. And the, the thing about the delegates meetings was that 
they were like a very fluid form of organization. I think our man was very conscious that she didn't want to have a permanent separate women's organization because she thought that it would become too sectional. And so therefore the delegate meetings were meant to be a lot more fluid than that. I should say that the Jeanne Gel wasn't just women. The men were encouraged to be involved as well. So it wasn't just women involved in it, but it was more or less that, you know, it wasn't many men didn't want to get involved. So that that was the work in Russia. Just to give some people some stats, I, one of your articles now I read, there was an incredible stat here. He said by 1919, there were 3000 public canteens in Moscow and Petrograd. And by 1920, more than 12 million members of the urban population ate in public canteens. And 40 percent and in Moscow, 40 percent of all housing was communal. Yeah. Like that's that that shows that it, like, well, I suppose there is some of that is probably just uh, the war economy as well and, and, and scarcity of food. But but still, it shows like, you know, what could be done communally cooking and housework is not the most enjoyable stuff in the world, is it? <laughs> No, <laughs> for most people. No, I mean, I think you're right. I think like when you when you see those figures, you realize that this was a very fluid, active population, you know, that people people were, a lot, were living in a far more collective way. Like you say, it's true that war communism was in there as well. The mobilization around war communism was obviously central in a certain sense to that. Also in that it shows that the state taking a stance, the state, you know, deciding to nationalize things, to to remove the market, does have an enormous impact on, on women and their ability to get out there and get involved when things were provided for need as opposed to profit. You know, more far more people can get involved in doing things. And, you know, it's just obviously it made a huge difference and interestingly like today i don't know if you've been to russia but even today you can see the fact that like there's lots and lots of canteens stalovaya canteens everywhere in russia now obviously today you have to pay for them but these are a remnant of that time which like provides you with basic food often really good food and in a very simple way but it's it's a remnant from the from the first days after the revolution that these canteens have continued to exist obviously in a different form to what they originally were but nevertheless they show you something about something real that happened after the revolution they're not something that were just introduced by stalin you know as a kind of as a way in which to get everybody involved in one of the five-year plans they were a real they were part of a real revolutionary movement yeah, I was in Poland in the late 90s and they still had similar things called uh, milk shops, they call them. But you go in and you get like you get a dinner and it was like, I think like for Western money at the time, I think it was about 10 pence, yeah. you know, so it was like, yeah. you know, it was ridiculously cheap. And, you know, it wasn't amazing, but it was grand. It was like when I was there, I was broke. So, I was, you know, you could live a day, 30 pence a day. It's great. You're happy with it. Yeah, You're no, dead yeah. happy. Yeah. No, it was yeah. amazing. Um, so do you want to tell us then about like uh, how things happened? You were talking about, say, uh, in on the steppe and in the eastern of Russia. What kind of work? How do I pronounce that? The gen? Gen. Yeah, awesome. It's just just je. Yeah, like, it's the second part that gets me. It's the Jen, oh, Jen, oh, yeah. You can just say the women's bureau. The women's That's bureau. Right. There we go. Yeah, the kind of Slavic languages do this thing where they put like oh. D's and N's and T's together, and it's very the, the sounds don't exist in English. You know, like in it's, 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 uh, uh, that kind of a sound. Um, Honestly, like I had to learn it. So believe me. I think it did took you, about five years to learn to pronounce Genotia. <laughs> <laughs> did you uh, did you have any Russian before you no, did your no, PhD? No. No, no, no. Oh my no, god. No. I know. That's a crash course. How do you how did you actually go about doing learning it? I found this woman, lived in Middleton. I live in Cove. <laughs> and she's uh, from Belarus. So she came and, and taught me. But I, wow. I I mean I wouldn't be able to speak it very fluently, but I can read and translate it now. But it's very, very difficult. Yeah, I had several nervous breakdowns on the way. <laughs> <laughs> but I was determined to learn it because I really wanted to know about it. And it doesn't seem like that much of what I wanted to know about was available in English. 
Was it difficult to, like, is Russian a difficult language to learn coming from English or Irish? Yes. Okay, first. that's good. <laughs> it's got a really, like, it's well, it's got its own alphabet, and then yeah, yeah. it's got very different sounds that you would never make. Like, is it lots of in European, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> like things in the back of your throat, you know? Yeah. There was a town when I was going when I was in Poland that time we were trying to learn how to say the stuff. And I remember there was like a town on the border with Germany and it was called Zhizhebshin, I think if I'm pronouncing <laughs> it right. And it was like, you know, there was about nine S C Zs in a row at start. I think it's Zhizhebshin. Very difficult stuff for us to get our yeah. our coarse brains around. Um yeah. so tell us any about this story okay. about the we'll about yeah. Okay, so Central Asia and Uzbekistan is where I really looked at. And also basically my source material was Kommunistka, which is the journal of the Women's Bureau of the Jeune Hotel, their activist journal. So I looked at their work in Central Asia, which really began in 1920 under Colin Tai's leadership. They began to send people out, obviously, People were going out anyway during the Civil War, you know, envoys, you know, to various parts of the former Russian Empire and, you know, trying to, I suppose, bring it all under Soviet control. And uh, in Central Asia, it was decided to set up a different form of organization to that in the rest of Russia. or so, Well, yeah, the Soviet Union, I suppose you'd say. So Colin Tai and some others decided that they would bring together women in an Eastern Women's Conference in Moscow in 19, I think it was 1921, early 1921. And they set up lots of different groups and delegates were sent to Moscow for this conference, but the conference was actually cancelled and um, because there was food shortages at the time and anyway, so that they cancelled it. So that never happened, which itself I think was a problem because the number of people that had came or had been due to come was quite significant. But anyway, after that, what they started to do was to hold conferences in the East. And what they agreed as a form of organization was what they called women's clubs. So this was like particularly important in Uzbekistan and Azerbaijan, where women in rural areas were were veiled and were not allowed to have contact with people outside men outside their own family so these clubs were women only clubs and within the clubs there would be some forms of we'll say handicraft work that they could get involved in and the hope would be that they'd be able to sell these things carpets or whatever else they made um, there would be crash facilities there would be medical consultations. There'll be all sorts of different, it was kind of like a hub, you'd say, you know, everything would be brought together. So the women could come to the center, could go in, could unveil, there'd be no threat to them from you know, like the rest of society for doing so. Children could be looked after and their social, economic and whatever else their needs could be met. So. That I thought was a very interesting approach because it's often argued that Colin Tai was very leftist and quite like, you know, she basically made decisions like, and she did, you know, to turn, for instance, like religious buildings into women's hospitals and things like that, which, you know, were often very unpopular. And also, you know, she challenged many of the ideas around families and how people should live, blah, blah, blah. But in any event, this was very culturally sensitive in my view. So they set so so they set those up, but they weren't necessarily very successful. And part of the problem was that and men in the family would be opposed to it because they'd see their women kind of going to the Soviets and they fear that. And also many communist men in Central Asia were opposed to it as well because they didn't see the women's rights question as part of the whole package that they'd signed up to in the civil war they didn't see this is not an issue for them and they didn't want their traditional way of life to be disrupted so there were like a lot of issues no you know there were some clubs were very successful like in azerbaijan 
in in Uzbekistan less so but you know there were I don't know 20 30 or so clubs then in in 1925 with national delimitation and the creation of the stands, including Uzbekistan, more women from the indigenous population, which who came from the, the Jadid movement, which were like a progressive Muslim movement in Central Asia, highly influenced by the movement in among Tartar Muslims, and where they got more involved, and somebody came up with an idea to set up women only shops and these were really very successful and what was very good about them is that they fulfilled a real need so women before them would have to go to the market with their husband or a male chaperone now they could come to these shops they could buy what they wanted they could unveil they could sell their own produce they they, they had meetings they kind of became like clubs except there were shops so they were like a cooperative they call them consumer cooperatives, but I think they were like a little bit of both. And they took off really like very, very well. And I think myself that the, the Women's Bureau, that the Jeanne Hotel had touched something real when they set them up. You know, they connected with something real. Like, you know how you said that the popularity of canteens, the public canteens and, you know, communal eating connected with something real in Moscow and St. Petersburg after the revolution or Petrograd after the revolution, I think these connected with something real. But basically they died a death in the mass unveiling campaign that was launched by Stalin's Central Committee in 1920, late 1926. So it seems to have been along the kind of lines when you read Marx of like the self emancipation yeah of the workers that on that the emancipation of the the women in uzbekistan that it has to be kind of self-emancipation that that's what we should always be heading for is self-emancipation not forced emancipation yeah well i think the idea of creating some kind of a space or an opportunity for somebody i think that's self and, and and that allows them to then do what they want with us make it what they want then i think that's the right approach I think self-emancipation doesn't mean being neutral, you know, because if you were to be neutral on the issue of women's status in Central Asia, you would really be alibying the repressive system, you know, like you would have still had men who said they were communists, but at home they were the, you know, the master. So the contradiction in society had to be brought to the fore, but in such a way I mean, you're right, in such a way that expressed the will of the women themselves and not the blueprint imposed on them by an organisation outside. I mean, that has it has been argued, and, and I oppose many of the arguments of academics who said basically that the Jeanne Hotel just really tried to, that it was just a servant of the Central Committee and that it basically was out to impose a form of secularism in Central Asia, which was alien to the women there. But while I do think that the work they did in these shops and clubs was really very interesting and, and progressive, they did at the same time promote, for instance, like divorce among women. They, 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 now I'm not saying there's anything wrong with them promoting divorce, and they also promoted women taking family members to court for attempted forced marriages and other kind of, you know, Sharia law practices. The difficulty was that oftentimes when women did these things, they didn't have a network, a new network that they could absorb into. So yes, you had these shops, but these shops were quite marginal in general. If women were divorced or were like left their family in that time, they ended up on the street somewhere, you know, and they ended up in prostitution. So there was a problem about how far they wanted to go in a scenario where the opportunities just weren't there. So th that was a real issue. I mean, they were aware of it, but they didn't really know what to do about it. So 
there are some there are, i think there are definitely are criticisms that can be made of them but are perhaps criticisms that show the limitations of the project would this also show a kind of a lack of buy-in resource wise from central leadership for this work definitely i mean resources were always small but when the new economic policy was introduced in 21 there were lots of cuts made to the general jail staffing and and in terms of like the cooperative movement in the east the women's section of that really lacked funding but i mean there were there were problems everywhere with funding obviously the situation of the Soviet Republic at the time was not good. It was isolated. And like that point has been made to me again and again, you know, that they would not have been able to do what they wanted to do, that it was utopian to expect it. So that even if you had the most supportive central committee, they still would have not been able to achieve what they wanted to achieve. And I think that's true, but at the same time, they didn't have the support. They, like, they have the, the central committee would say things like we support the work of the general jail and we want the emancipation of women and all the rest but they didn't actually do anything they didn't actually do anything to insist that the cooperatives sold the goods that were made in the clubs you know they didn't do anything to integrate them i think it's true that the, their problems reflected the lack of support and they also obviously reflected the concrete conditions. In the article, you said that Colin Ty agitated against NEP. What was her thinking there? So she was part of the workers' opposition, and she, in fact, ended up being the main spokesperson for the workers' opposition in the debates. So she argued, and workers' opposition platform argued, for, uh, for more trade union involvement in running the economy and they believed that that basically there was wrong to retreat to forms to market forms to reintroducing forms of the market into into soviet society and um she and Shlaplikov and others they lost that debate i think she was not alone in the sense of or even perhaps even the workers opposition themselves were not alone in being concerned about what was happening, about the way things were going, and about a growing bureaucratism. So it was both the market being introduced, which, which meant that, for instance, with the new economic policy, the introduction of the market in Russia meant that lots and lots of women lost their jobs and were consigned back to the home. And men came back from the civil war and took over their jobs. And basically, you know, there was a emergence of a new very reactionary culture so her arguments were both i suppose about the impact of the soviet project of the new economic policy concerns about a growing intolerance and bureaucratism and also the impact on women's achievements on the achievements that they've made so far of introduction so it was obviously it was a retreat i think it's it's accepted that it was a retreat. There's still, I think, there is still an argument about to what extent it was necessary. Sometimes I feel that, well, certainly when I raised it, that I'm told, well, you know, look, it just had to happen. There was no way around it, and it's pointless to even argue otherwise. But I think that, for instance, on the women's question and the new economic policies, that there, there were things that could have been done with promotion of cooperatives as opposed to moving towards more like single manager you know type factory ownership models which 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 they did move towards but anyway or even job share there's no reason why that couldn't have been as efficient as just women in the house and men in the that might have been a very politically difficult thing to impose but it's not like that material conditions necessitate all action you know yeah, and I think uh, the general jail did continue to try and promote cooperatives after the introduction of the NEP because they thought that this was a way of ensuring that women could remain involved in society 
could earn some money and could play a useful role. So I think that they, that I, I think myself that that was something that could have been looked at. I mean, I haven't gone and looked at the arguments around cooperatives at the time, but it would be interesting to do so to see what what exactly was been said. I think like again to say that I think obviously given the isolation of the Soviet Union and the problems it faced internationally, there were bound to be major retreats, but I think how you retreat does matter also. And I think the fact that after the end of the civil war, the fact that so many women lost their jobs was an enormous step backwards. And um, like obviously things changed with the introduction of the five year plan and women then were forced to go back into the workforce. But the kind of central component of work as a, I suppose, as a pathway towards liberation that was most certainly lost. Tell us then about what this Hujum campaign was. So in 1926, there were discussions on the Central Committee and in the Central Asian Bureau of the Party about, I suppose, essentially about what they were what they were going to do next. And the five year plan was obviously something that was in the offing and it was agreed that they would launch a campaign against all what they call vestiges of the old, of the reactionary old. And then this decision went hand in hand with the war on religion, which was also really launched in that period. And the party members were told that they had to ensure that their wives and daughters and relatives took part in a mass unveiling campaign which was to be launched on the 8th of March 1927 and the idea that was promoted was that by unveiling publicly and burning their parangi and the chakvon, the facial covering, that women in the East were taking part in a revolutionary demonstration of defiance against Islam and against traditional society. And that this revolutionary act would spearhead revolutions in all parts of that society that it would be, it was like lighting a fire and it would just destroy everything that was reactionary and enable women to come forward and be equal. So the thing with the Genotiel's work is that they had never promoted mass unveiling. And in fact, they had been very careful not to do so because they were concerned that if they did anything like that, then their projects would be closed down, that, they, that women wouldn't continue to come because it would be too much of a threat. It's not to say that they didn't want unveiling, they did, and Colin Ty in particular was very, very keen on the idea of the, you know, the enslaved woman unveiling and kind of, you know, marching forward with open face, you know, towards revolution and socialism. So there were some disquiet about it among the Russian women. There was disquiet about it, but among indigenous women in Uzbekistan, I can say. It was it, it, it was a popular idea. I think Jadid women who'd come into the party, the indigenous women, were very influenced by Tartar women who hadn't worn the veil for a long time and were far more secular. And they sort of believed the propaganda, I would say. And it, there was like a lot of reorganization of people who were seen to be loyal or disloyal. So, you know, people like Lubimova who had been in charge of the Uzbek genocel was moved sideways because of her concerns. Anyway, so basically on March the 8th, there were these demonstrations and it was reported that 70,000 women had gone out onto the streets on mass demonstrations and burned their veils. It was reported widely in the Soviet Union that there'd been this enormous revolutionary action, but the backlash was swift. And almost immediately following that day, 
There were attacks on women, attacks on women, the general jail, attacks on ordinary women, there were women murdered. It was just like indigenous society was not able to tolerate such a radical, I suppose, attack on itself. And in particular, obviously, the clergy promoted attacks on unveiled women and attacks on the Genot Gel. And the March action was followed by another one on the 1st of May. And then that similar, had a similar fate. They had these massive demonstrations, relative terms. And then afterwards, there was a backlash and lots of women were murdered and attacked. And lots of women who had unveiled, well, the majority of women, 95% of women who had unveiled, uh, started to wear the veil again because and it became very unsafe for them to go out. Anne emailed me afterwards with a correction to the numbers on these demonstrations. The numbers on the demo on March 8th, the initial unveiling was 10,000. And by May of that same year, they were reporting 90,000 unveiled. And this hudgem had a very, very negative effect on the genital's work and essentially it destroyed their work. The shops were closed down. Uh, the cooperative said there was no need, the cooperative movement said there was no need for the shops anymore because basically women were all unveiled anyway, which wasn't true. And they closed down the women only shops. The clubs, nobody came to them anymore. They fell into disrepair, you know, disuse. And essentially their work was destroyed. They were very angry about that. Lots of women who had worked for a long time trying to build up these enterprises saw everything destroyed. So, yeah, it was an enormously reactionary endeavour, which owes far more to an attempt by the Central Committee to control women, really, by using them as a way to attack their own society and also as a way to soften up Central Asian society for the five-year plan. So soften up. So what do you mean by soften them up? What did they have to get them well, ready for? I think for? that they basically wanted to destroy the hold of the clergy and they wanted to destroy autonomy, I think, in the region. And they wanted to destroy, I suppose, kind of like anything of the old. They want Because obviously they wanted to build these mass factories and these mass farms. So they wanted to be able to get to mobilize people en masse for a project which came from outside Central Asia, you know? So I think that they thought that, that the Hudson would destroy the hold of the clergy and maybe that it would mobilize a lot more women to support the Soviet project and that would enable them to have more success in drawing those women into work in collective farms and factories. Maybe it wasn't as worked out as that, but it seems to certainly, to me, have that kind of aim. Destroying the fabric of that peasant society, how it operated. Did they end up destroying the power of the imams in those central states? Yeah, I think they did, actually. I think so. Like, initially, like this, but there are arguments among ac academics about the extent to which they did destroy them. But I think that they did... They probably like they they did ultimately with the five year plan obviously because so many people you know that opposed it were murdered so like that was the ultimate but they they definitely undermined their authority things never went back to how they'd been before the hudgem society had went through an enormous convulsion really it had it had a big psychological impact on society on indigenous society. I mean, women obviously were very afraid initially and men were felt very threatened and the church was, uh, the clergy was very defensive, but they, they continued after the hudgem, they continued with the anti-religious front in the years after that, that continued to kind of beat away at all of that and to like, you know, for instance, they, they'd had red mullahs clerics who supported the Soviet project, but like that, that all went, you know, there was, it was just all religion was reactionary. In fact, if you look at 
my I think I've, I've discussed it in some of my articles, there was opposition to all of that from the general jail, particularly from Nadia Kupskaya, spoke out against this whole like anti-religious front at the time and how reactionary it was to, you know, remove people's religious practices in that manner to just to try to destroy religion by by force. Is there anything we haven't discussed? I was going to move it on to another topic, but is there anything we haven't discussed here? The one thing that I didn't say was that there was a debate in 1928 in the pages of Komunistka about the Hudjum and about the role of the party and the women's question. And that was really very interesting because here we are in 1928, you know, it wasn't a time that anybody was really sticking their head above the parapet, but Nadia Kupskaya was the editor of Kommunistka, launched this debate. And the contributions to it basically ranged from arguments that the Hudjum, you know, was just like really superficial and that in reality, the majority of Communist Party men didn't want women's liberation to discussions about autonomy and the creation in Kazakhstan of societies against Callum and Callum being bride price, autonomous organizations. And there were people like Lubimova and Krupskaya to some extent who said, you know, there's no problem with these autonomous organizations, but they're not going to be effective without the weight of the party behind them. And then there were others who were saying, no, 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 these are just reactionary. These are feminist and we don't want anything to do with them. So there was a conference in December 1928 and there was the debate continued on at that. But then at the same time, the party central committee leadership brought along its heavyweights. Yaroslavsky, who had been prominent in the anti-religious front, he spoke at it and basically the debate was crushed. And Krupskaya doesn't appear in the pages of Kommunistka in 1929 except for October that year and it's to do with you know the legacy of Lenin so she's made into the official widow you know that's become her definite place you know that's that's you lady that's your role from now on don't think you can challenge us and our ideas or don't use Lenin to attack us and the journal itself Although it like went from monthly or bi-monthly, which it often was, it went from there to fortnightly. It basically, there was no debate in it. There was no discussion at all, really. It was just all anti-religious front. The, you know, they used nastuplenia, which is the Russian word for hudrum, which means attack. They used that kind of in, in all different kinds of ways. You know, the, it was all about attack and it was all about confrontation and assault. And then in 1930, uh, March 1930, they closed the organization down. Stalin apparently called the leader of the Genot jail at the time, Artu Kuina, and in and said, basically, we're closing it down. It's become a problem for us. And basically, the argument that they made was that instead of the women's question being an issue for women only it's going to be an issue for the entire party which basically it wasn't it was a way to get rid of it and i think it was just they wanted to close down those voices that had been articulated in the debate in 1928 in central asia and also there were debates in the rest of russia about what was going on they didn't want I suppose any opposition was part of the closing down of opposition. But what I find sometimes a bit infuriating when I see articles on how life was better for women under the Soviet Union or whatever, is that really all that happened after the closure of the Genotel was that partly like the imagery of women's emancipation was used in order to justify their actual oppression. And at the same time, such kind of rights as had as as did exist were ones from an earlier time. So you know, like you see the woman on the factory, sorry, on the tractor with the headscarf, you know, those very kind of like, well, they're very common, those images, that powerful images perhaps from the time. 
they belie a very different reality because obviously those women did you know get up on the tractor and do all of that heavy work in fact women often did very heavy work but also at the same time they had the role of housewife and mother and you know as well as as all of that so all they, that had, as they, well. had, they hadn't been liberated at all after the once the five year plans came in, was the I think there was research there showing that the jobs that the women got given were, you know, the worst yeah. and the most menial jobs, yeah. in, you know, in the factories and et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's the research that shows that women did get the worst jobs in the factories. I mean, obviously, like, I don't know if that was, I don't know if that's completely true because I think that there were areas where women did excel also like in medicine and in other areas so it's hard to say kind of give a general answer on that but i would say for certain to to begin with and especially in the soviet east women did get the dregs the the, the worst jobs like it kind of reflects the role that they had beforehand insofar as women were often the you know the kind of like described, Collins had describes them as like being like a pack animal, you know, in that peasant society that under the five-year plan, then that's kind of, they went back to playing their role. Some people might be kind of surprised, I don't know, but like Colin Ty and these, the, the women that were part of the Genot Del, they did not consider themselves feminists and they were actually consider themselves well you can describe it better can you explain this might be their their logic and their thinking behind this attitude towards feminism at the time so the feminism so first wave feminism which is what's you know, described as the feminism of the late 19th early 20th century was primarily i suppose it was primarily about getting the vote about rights equal rights for women in terms of the vote and they were a lot of the organizations were dominated by very kind of middle class or upper class women and the genotiel and kolontai and other socialist women didn't see this as the project that was going to liberate women and they believed that it was a project that was just about getting rights for the upper class or middle class women and they believed that you needed to connect the struggle for liberation with the struggle for socialist transformation. So they very deliberately said that they were not feminists. Feminism was a, a sectional struggle and they, they ended up being in the middle because they argued against feminism. And at the same time, they were arguing for women's rights within the socialist project. So they had a battle on both sides. But no, they, they would have said that they're not feminists. I mean, some people have said that today that would be different because now we've got socialist feminism. But I still don't, I, 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 I don't agree with that analysis or that kind of conclusion because I think that what they, what they, their argument was that basically Marxism is about human liberation and human liberation includes women's liberation and women's emancipation. It's a universal project. So if you say you're a Marxist feminist, then what's your Marxism? That's how I would think about it. They, their argument was that the emancipation of women will come through the emancipation of the proletariat, essentially. Yeah, so basically their argument was that the role of women that women have to play a central role in the communist revolution, that it's a universal revolution and that the ideas of Babel and Engels and people like Clara Zetkin, who was extremely important, extremely influential, and she had set up or been part of setting up a women's movement, working class women's movement in Germany, that, that, that this had to be a central part of it, women's emancipation. And so, and so therefore the overthrow of the state and the overthrow of the family been part and parcel of the same dynamic being basically a social revolution in in all senses of the words and i think that the fact that they were like kind of marginal voice really 
I think you can say, I think Zetkin was, was successful. She had many successes, Clara Zetkin, in Germany. But, it, but in Russia, it remained a problem for them, as I've described. But I still think that, well, like, and I suppose that was part of the reason I got involved in this study was, A, I wanted to know what had actually happened. I mean, I'd been in politics for decades and I'd always been very vocal on issues to do with women's rights. And I still didn't really know what had happened in the Soviet Union. Like I'd always been told, well, they got formal equality, but after that, there wasn't really much else that could be done. And then when I found out that, no, well, actually, that's not true. You know, that there had been this attempt, a really forceful, serious attempt to make real change. I thought, well, there you go. Even in that situation, you can bring about enormous change in thinking as well as in the manner in which we live. I thought, well, that, that you know, that must be it. That must be, if you're a Marxist, that must be how you deal with it rather than go like, that's my Marxism because, that, and there's my feminism. In, in my view, that leads to the idea of Marxism as a kind of an economic model and feminism as a kind of a social one, if you see what I mean. I know like lots of people don't agree with me and I even think about myself sometimes, I think, well, hmm, am I sure about that? But I still, keep, I still keep coming back to what is our Marxism. It seems to be a thing that it tries to delineate between, you know, this is social relations over here and these are economic relations. You don't have to read too much of Marx to see how he thinks, you know, it's it's a kind of a unity, isn't it? That they're all interacting. It seems to be inextricably linked together. It is. Like, I know in other discussions you're having, you're talking about ecology and like Marxism and ecology and people going back to look and see what he wrote. And even if he didn't write a lot going, well, Yes, what's that about? And how can we build on that? How can we develop that? Maybe that's what I'm I'm also trying to do, to go back and see what they wrote. Not like, oh, I found these scriptures somewhere and there we go, you know, they've told <laughs> the me lost, what to do. The Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. Exactly. Not that, but like <laughs> what and what they said can we develop and build on? Like it's interesting because lots of people on the left still refer to Engels, Private Property and the Family, as being, you know, the book which tells us about primitive communism and matriarchy. But there's been nothing really written since it that's built on that. I'm not saying that I'm the person to do that, God no, but I think that it does need to be done. If we are going to locate women's emancipation within the Marxist project, then we have to develop our theory on that. And one of the criticisms I have of the Bolsheviks is that they didn't do that. Like Colin Ty is criticized for being leftist and like she does have articles where she says, you know, the state needs to draw up a list of the ways in which we need to, you know, relate to each other, very prescriptive. But at least she was just trying to think about it, to develop her theory and ideas. And it didn't happen. It didn't happen outside of that. I think like we have to acknowledge that in our tradition, you know, that that was a failing in our tradition. Like one of the criticisms I've had from comrades in CPGB is that I've kind of, you know, been out to put the Bolsheviks on trial for their failures. And I just think, well, no, that's like just such a stupid way to look at it. Because like if you support an organizational or an organization's endeavors, and that's part of your history. If you then not to mention their failings seems to me like making them into some kind of, oh, I don't know, God kind of type figures. Deity. A deity. And also it doesn't like, it really doesn't assist our project because I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm not going to, maybe through my work, other people will go, oh, OK, well, we, we did have this movement. Wow, I didn't know about this movement. Maybe. Maybe communism has something to offer women today, because a lot of time women don't see it like that. Like the women are very few in number on the left, don't play any prominent role on the left. Women still experience lots of, I suppose, sexual inequality and more on the left. And more, and yeah, more. And more, and more. 
and um, there's lots of lots of conservatism on social and sexual questions on the left so the left has to change totally like even i know my podcast is probably kind of highly economics focused so it's kind of self-selecting but like even in my listenership i i see that it's i would think quite a lot more than 90 percent male yeah, you know, and yeah. trying to find for me personally, trying to find female Marxists, not even not even find them, they just kind of come across that I I am interested in their work. It just it it just it it's so unbelievably male. It's so male dominated. It's it's kind of incredible, you know. One thing, like, do you think this uh, move from kind of like this idea of the you know, the revolution and the society's revolution, emancipating women as a section of, of that, like as revolutionary left in the West has, you know, receded over the years. It seems kind of obvious that people will call themselves nearly Marxist feminists now, because even the idea of revolution, it's kind of like people, you know, they kind of look at you like you're half mad if you say you're, you know, a revolutionary Marxist you know, that people can call themselves a Marxist feminist and it talks to their their politics without actually, I suppose it has some kind of social cachet or something that the politics we're talking of, of, of you and, and Colin Ty's ideas, it, it seems kind of to like leftoids as kind of gone with a high bike or something. No, I think you've got a good point there. I think one of the issues that we have to deal with is the fact that the second wave feminism in the 1960s and 70s came about in a situation where the left, I mean, the communist parties had done sweet fuck all for women for decades. Like there's a book coming out next year, which has been edited by Mike Tabor and Daria Durkanova on the communist women's movement, which was set up in 1920 and closed down more or less around the same time as the Genoche. But one of the motions to one of the congresses from Clara Zetkin was for women's commissions, women's sections to be set up in all the parties. And there was a lot of problems. They had a lot of problems making that argument. And I think it never actually really happened. And like lots of the time, women in communist parties were making the tea and cakes and so when you had the women's movement emerge, lots of the women that were prominent in that had come from the left, but had not found any support for their emancipation among the left. Like, you know, you just have to look at all of the, the leading figures and you can see that. And I think that that is a real issue that the left itself has found to be lacking when it came to it. So I, I suppose, I, I I can see the points you're making, but I think I think that the problem, you know, about like you know, given the weakness of the left, that the way that 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 putting feminism and Marxism together is a way of kind of connecting something. But I think it it is only for women then, really, isn't it? Like, not many men would call themselves Marxist feminists. Yeah, it's also shown just the influence of the second wave feminism, isn't it? Really. Yeah. Along with the failures of actual communists. But you know, like on a on a positive note, the struggle for abortion rights in Ireland, the referendum in 2018, the role particularly of younger men in that, and to some extent mm -hmm. older men in that as well, was so important. Like yeah. I remember at the beginning of it been involved in some online group and there were like a lot of stuff about whether men could be involved and in what basis could men only be like supportive or could men have a voice and all of that went with you know younger men in particular say well hang on a second I'm campaigning for a yes vote here because I don't want my daughter or my sister or my partner to ever have to go through while women in the past have gone through. So they kind of made it their own struggle in a certain sense. They didn't, you know what I mean? It wasn't just. I was uh, flabbergasted by the, the result. What was the final, was it, what was the final vote? So, Overall. Oh, <laughs> I can't remember. It I was, can't remember that, either. It was pretty devastatingly. Was it, it wasn't, it was, like, was it 70, 30? Was it, 70, like it was between 65 and 70 percent yes i think so like some places in dublin had over 70 some like donegal was the only one 
to vote no. That's and, right. And, and marginally, those poor bastards that had been around the <laughs> campaign in Donegal, <laughs> out in Donegal, cut town and killy begs every weekend. But I mean, like, obviously, that's quite a conservative society still. But it was more or less 60 plus and 70 plus in Dublin and other urban areas. It was a huge swing. Like, it's just remarkable, I think, that people didn't realise how much men would want women to have those rights. Yes, like, it's unifying. It's, yeah. it's a sense of unity and not a, a divisive issue. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, it, what I suppose the point I was making is that that was a positive experience and that showed the importance of men and women struggling together for women's rights and it not being just a woman's issue in that in that kind of sense that it's only to be left to the women to speak on but that it, it affects men in their lives and in terms of their own their own emancipation as human beings you know obviously i've kind of forgotten to well i'm sure it's like implicit in everything i've said but to emphasize the point that this is like a class question but i mean but as the working class being a class that campaigns for emancipation as opposed to only working class women being emancipated of, of us like not giving a damn about the problems of the upper class women i think the attitude i would like to take is that we campaigned for the emancipation of all of all and that the only possible way to do it is to overthrow this bloody society oh. <laughs> that's next next week we'll, we'll do that next week <laughs> i go out and uh, get tuned up <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well thanks very much for coming on the show today Anne. well thank you thanks so much i really appreciate it it's like great to get an opportunity to talk about this work and hopefully you know it'll be useful i don't know hope so anyway Here's hoping. <laughs> yeah. On this episode, you heard the team tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. Thank you for listening, and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.